Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that you would let your word penetrate our spirits today, our hearts, our minds, our souls. I ask that you would just quicken us with your word, quicken us with your presence, and help us to glean today the things that you are saying to us, that the engrafted word would be sown into us and that we would produce a great crop, 30, 60, and 100 fold from what we receive today in Jesus' name. And all the receivers said, Amen. Amen. Now, obviously, in this, uh, Paul is speaking to the human existence, right? He's talking about the struggle between where you are and where you want to be. And I think that, uh, you know, that takes up a lot of time in our lives. And that could actually become a ghost. Now, you know, it was interesting. I mean, it's been about uh, at least three years. Sam or Judah, neither one of them, Judah's on drill this weekend, but when we went back to his graduation back east, uh, we heard this phrase that was shouted, and it was their motto for their whole platoon during boot camp. And, uh, and that, that, that motto was always forward. Always forward. And as I heard this unpack, I mean, it just gave me goosebumps. It gave me, it was like, oh, that's exactly what Paul says always forward and what I learned was that their drill instructors the DIs would, would roll up on you know and, and, and listen boot camp in his day was different than boot camp in my day right and boot camp in my day was a little bit different than you know some of those who went boot, to boot camp before me I was in that transition period where they couldn't hit you anymore right uh, they just did about everything else, but they just, you know, they couldn't hit you anymore. Uh, I was in the, you know, in the, when, when I went through the Coast Guard, I was in that transition period where they, they, they used to say, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. I mean, the Coast Guard used to go out on everything for everything. And then, you know, after they lost a few boats and, you know, several sailors, they thought, ah, that's a little bit too expensive, and we got to change that model. So anyway, here we are uh, at his graduation, Judah's, Judah's graduation, and they're saying this, and I said, what? Tell me more about this. And the drill instructors, every time somebody would make a mistake, rather than rolling up on them, you know, and screaming and cussing and doing all kinds of nasty stuff, they would embed in them this concept of always forward. They realized, I mean, you know, these young men knew they made a mistake. They knew they messed up. They knew what they did was wrong. And the DI would say, okay, so, you know, whatever. And, and their response was always forward. And so that's what they drilled into them. For every mistake, I think there's the word of the Lord here for the body of Christ. Instead of allowing it to become something that haunts us, something that sticks with us, we learn the lesson, oh yeah, that was, I didn't do that right. I, I need to move forward. I need to go forward. Always forward. That's what we need to do. That's the call. You know, we, we, we can't go back and undo what we just did, but we can go forward. And you know, holiday seasons, holidays are fun. Most of the time. Right? They also give you an opportunity to grow. I think every Christmas throughout my life has been an opportunity to grow. And, uh, you know, when you're faced with the ghosts of Christmas past or even past Christmases, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have opportunity to grow. One of my past ghosts that haunted me was the dynamic of dealing with family. How many have family? Oh, don't raise your hands. You, know, you all have family, right? I mean, there's always that reality of having to deal with a family. Family is family, and it's never by choice, right? I mean, you don't get to choose your family. You're just born into it. You're dropped into it. It's like, boom, here you go. This is your family. But friends, you get to choose, 
right? You get to choose your friends. And uh, the family are just there, like it or not. And the good ones, the good ones, and thank God we've got two so far, right, are uh, in loves, right? They're the in loves. Uh, and then there are some that are just the in laws. That they're, they're there, they're in laws, you know. It, you get the in loves and then the in laws, and then some of them are the outlaws. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you got, you know, you're right there with me, right? Uh, you know, and uh, there's always going to be someone in your life that's bound to happen that's going to be hard to deal with. You know, that one that traditionally offends you, steps on your toes, whatever. Or maybe you offend them, right? Maybe it's your religion, your politics, or you're just your general views, or just the fact that you talk or don't talk. I don't know. Maybe you know someone who's easily offended, right? I think in the, you know, the, the spirit of the culture that we have today, all of us are challenged while we're driving. I can't tell you how many IQs I've seen out there. You know, they raise their hand and show you their IQ as one. You know what I'm talking about? Usually when I see that one IQ come out me, I just wave the whole flock back. <laughs> I don't fly a bird, I fly them all. <laughs> Sorry. Where was I? Right? These guys, they cut you off in your lane and it's like, I don't get it. I was talking to Judah just the other day. It's like Seattle has some of the highest insurance rates for one reason, one reason only, because people are too close to your bumper. And we have one of the highest rear end rates in the nation. Right? It's like Seattleites are rear enders. It's like, that's just gross. It's like, it's horrible. And it costs you and me money. Because everybody's in such a hurry, and you know, there's all these crashes all the time. And that, you know, I mean, who, who doesn't get upset about that? You know, you're on your way to work, and it's going to take you 30 minutes or 60 minutes extra just because somebody was traveling to, ah, right? What a distracted driving, thank God, now is a law, right? I still see people with their cell phones in their hands. And it's like, man, I just wish I had a camera on every window, forward, back, you know, so we could just shoot pictures and email them to the state. It would be awesome. We have these automatic cameras that email these people that are texting and driving. How, how, no wonder we have all these accidents, right? But this one really gets me, though. We've got distracted driving laws, but... I think it's time the church should have a distracted relationship law. Right? And uh, that has everything to do with technology. That's what I'm talking about. Right? Constantly scrolling through Instagram or Facebook. The young ones, it's Instagram. The older ones, it's Facebook. <clears throat> and uh, Twitter. Right? Checking text messages. It's like, why? Why don't you just hang up and hang out? I think I'm going to try and find a little basket and a sign and uh, say, deposit your technology here. Uh, honestly, we've had, we've had people in our home who have been sitting across the room from each other texting. I'm like, really? At my house. Right? And so I'm like, here, this ghost is getting me, right? <laughs> it's like, ah! Well, how about that family member who's really the outlaw, who is uh, always critiquing how you raise your kids? Hmm? We got none of those in here, right? So I, right? Can I tell you, let me, let me, let me you know, on a little secret about me. Let me is, can I tell you, on, can I tell on me today? I was the guy that was on the receiving end of that. Right? I, and every year, the ghost of Christmas would haunt me. This ghost, this thing, this issue would just be, <gasps> ah, 
right? Because when we were young and in the ministry, we had little boys. Well, J J Jared was first. Oh, my, oh, my. The first grandchild. And I got to tell you, everybody lined up to tell us how to do it. Do you know the, some of these people that lined up to tell us how to do it got suddenly quiet when they got their own? Imagine how that works out. Right? I mean, they were so full of opinion when it was our kid, but then when they had their own minions, every child needs Jesus. They suddenly got quiet. But then there was, you know, there were those outlaws that weren't always quiet. Now, I believe boys should be boys. Just saying. I just think the children ought to be allowed to be children and to express themselves like children. I was not raised under the philosophy that children should be seen but not heard. I think that's weird. I think it's demonic. Honestly, I think it is repressive. It, 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 it's so wrong. And I never allowed that. And I think that, you know, that was how I offended my outlaws is because I let my boys wrestle. I let them run. I let them, you know, do things that boys do. Boys climb and, you know, they pick their noses and, uh, you know, you, you break that eventually. But, uh, man, you got to let kids be kids. That's why I'm not all, you know, I don't get all weirded out up front, you know, when little kids are up here doing whatever the kids do. That, they're kids. I love kids. Jesus loves them too, you yeah. know. I don't mind that at all. And so, um, honestly, that could be a, an issue. And it was, for me, it was an issue, right? Uh, that you know, now you're getting into the holidays, and how do you deal with this? This was a ghost of Christmas past. You know, the Bible tells us that we just got to know it's impossible for offenses not to come. It's going to happen. Sooner or later, you're going to get offended. They're going to get it. Somebody's going to get offended. Right? And it, I mean, here it is, Christmas time. And you're with your family. And that's the last thing in the world you want to have going on is an offense, right? And, and listen, there can be no dealing with the Christmas, the ghosts of Christmas present or the ghosts of Christmas future if you don't deal with the ghosts of Christmas past. The offenses that have come, how do you deal with these? How do you handle it when the serious stuff comes? Now, I just talk about one thing, but what about if somebody betrays you? Well, literally, I did have a betrayal, young and in the ministry, and it was over our kids. We had somebody actually go from our city to the home sending church and say, you know, you need to do, disqualify that guy because his kids are out of line. Oh. They didn't tell me over there. They took care of it. They just said, no, their kids are not out of line. You are out of line. And, you know, they, they had my back over there. But, boy, I'll tell you, when I found out, I have to admit, I, it, it was a ginger snap moment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I had, to, I had to undo that damage later. But <laughs> it wasn't pretty. What do you do? You know, how do you handle that? How do you handle lies or separations of relationship? Listen, church, you know, life hasn't always been pretty for me. There was one, one Sunday, or uh, weekend, I should say, a Friday night. We had a great time at Portland Bible College. We were going to capture the flag. I decided, boom, I'm going to run home uh, afterwards and surprise mom and dad. To, and I come home to an empty house. Mom had left. What's going on here? Well, uh, you know, and dad wasn't saying much, and <laughs> mom was nowhere to be found. And what do you do? These break up of relationships, and then ultimately ended up in divorce for them. Uh, they were in my family. They were the couple that would always be together. They were the ones that had it all together. They were the ones that had it all. And nobody else in the family did this. Got divorced, but they did, and they were the ones that were the rest of the family were looking to. 
It was just the craziest thing. What do you do? I mean, what do you do with these things? How, I mean, it's hard to sit with your family and your loved ones and open gifts and have the warm fuzzies or a heart like Jesus during these times, right? I mean, here we are in a season where it's supposed to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And you go through some of these things and, you know, they kind of ghost you. How do you celebrate the season? How do you love Jesus in these times even? When somebody's offended or you have an offense with somebody, you know, what's going on? Can I just tell you that life is too short? That your calling is too great? Life is too short and your calling is too big to live with ghosts. It really is. Stephen Furtick uh, said this, small people hold big grudges. I love that. I, that is so good. You go, Stephen. He's a dynamic pastor, I tell you. He's an amazing, amazing guy. We've got to make some decisions here and now. Just like Scrooge had to make some decisions. How are you going to deal with the ghosts of Christmas past? What are you going to do? You want a better present, right? Everybody wants a better present. Everybody wants a better future. But unless you deal like Ebenezer, unless you dealt with what got you there... Well, we see in the Christmas carol where it leads without any change. Life is the same way for us. If we don't make some changes, if we don't deal with the ghosts of Christmas past, if we don't become a ghost buster, listen to this passage in Proverbs 19. It says, a person with discretion is not easily angered. He gains respect by overlooking an offense. Now, overlooking isn't the same thing as saying it didn't happen. Not even close. It's two different worlds. It's not the same thing. It's just a conscious decision to let it go, to overlook it. Just look the other way. Yeah, sure, it happened. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word overlook here that, that he's using here means to pass over. That should be a familiar term for most Christians. Pass over. Pass over. You see, because that's what the Bible tells us that Christ is our Passover. What Jesus has done for us, what he did for you, what he did for me, what he did for all the world, he passed over our sin, our transgressions, our faults. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says Christ, our Passover. What motivated God to do this? You know the answer. It's not a trick question. What motivated God to do this? I heard it somewhere. It was his love. That's what motivated him to pass over the sin of the world. Come on, man. We're as guilty as sin. But he still did it. We were guilty, guilty, guilty. In fact, some of us were still sinning. We all, most all of us, were still sinning when he passed over. When he overlooked, didn't take account of it. We were the offenders. In fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us this, that God demonstrates his love. This is how he demonstrates his love towards you and towards me. That why we were still in a wrong place, not living right. Jesus died for us. To take over, to pass over, to cleanse, to remove our faults, our sins. So, why shouldn't we overlook or pass over or make allowance for others as well? especially as we go into this season, this Christmas season, to put it into our, our hearts and our minds that I am, I am going to be motivated by love. I'm just going to love this season. I, I, anybody does anything, I determine right now. That guy cuts me off in my lane. I'm not going to show my IQ. I'm just going to say, bless him, Lord, with some wisdom. You know, the first tools in a Ghostbusters equipment pack are these. 
humility, gentleness, patience. These are the tools that we need in this season. It's getting hectic. Has anybody been out shopping? It's crazy. I thought everybody did it online now. I'm the kind of guy that <clears throat> in years past, I, I would go out on Christmas Eve to shop. I can't do that this year because we'll be here, right? Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Isn't this the season to show that love? Making allowance. What's that? That's giving people the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, in our text in, in, in Philippians 3.12, Paul told us that we have not attained. We're not perfect. Nobody here is perfect. Your pastor's not perfect. Sorry to disappoint you. It's just a reality. You know, these genes come on one leg at a time. Right? Just like that. All right. Since we're not perfect, and we know we're not perfect, can we just... Can we just make allowances for others' imperfections? I mean, if we're not perfect, how can we expect anybody else to be perfect? And, and we can do this if we operate in the love of God, but what keeps us from operating in the love of God? Ghosts. You see, when we feel poorly about ourselves, it's easy to fall into the trap of comparing ourselves with others. So looking and seeing the faults in other people. And that makes us feel better about ourselves. Why is it so much easier to do this? Why is, why is it that, you know, the Bible, Jesus even taught on this whole subject. He, 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 he told people, be careful. You know, because when you're looking at the speck in that person's eye, well, what about the plank that's in your own? Right? Somebody's got, oh, 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 Tom, you got this, you got this little issue we need to talk about, right? And here I'm coming with this something big, you know, I'm, I'm like pig pen. <laughs> with all this stuff, it's so, there's a cloud of, you know, dust and, I'm not just a speck, but a cloud, right? And yet I'm going to be the one, you know? <sighs> you know, when you point like that, you got three of them coming right back at you. That's why I do this. Listen, when we do this, when we, when we compare ourselves among ourselves, or when we begin to see in others the things that we don't like, and we want to deal with issues in their life, it gives us a false sense of being okay. It's really what happens. You lull yourself into this place where, you know, then the world begins to revolve around you. And you start grading on a curve. Can I tell you heaven doesn't grade on a curve? Grades on holiness and righteousness. The standard is Jesus. And the only person we should compare ourselves to is Jesus and his word right there. Listen, when others get your goat, you know what I mean by that, get your goat, you know, get, get under your skin or a burr under your saddle or thorn in your side. You, you, when I say get your goat, you know what I say? If you got a goat to get, your goat's going to get got. So why don't you get rid of that goat? Maybe the issue isn't them. Oh, maybe it's your goat. Why do you have a goat? You know, there's a big difference between goats and sheep. The goats don't make it. 
Goats say, but, 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 and that's all they do. They butt. Goats butt you. Sheep just say, amen. But when others do get our goat, isn't it interesting? Isn't this just interesting that we judge other people by their actions? But because we live in this world, we judge ourselves by our intents. How do I judge you by your action? But I know my own heart and intents are right. Doesn't that sound like a double standard to you? I mean, somebody could call it hypocrisy. Wow, Christmas message. Come on, Pastor. But this is a ghost. This is a ghost that really messes up family and people. This is real. This is reality. This is where the rubber meets the road. We need, to, we need more love because, see, if we're operating in love, we don't judge others by their actions. We give them the benefit of the doubt. Because love, love, love covers, love assumes no wrong. Love doesn't judge people that way. Listen, there's another parable, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy getting into the parables, because, you know, the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, they were self-centered. Think about it. Ever, it didn't matter what time. They went out in the morning, later morning, lunchtime, after lunch and in the evening. They all got paid the same thing. But because of the self-centeredness, the people who were out there all day long said, hey, you paid the guy that was out there for an hour the same thing that you just paid me. What's wrong with you? Well, they had contracted the rate. Right? I mean, that's just that whole selfish center, again, illustrated in scriptures. That, you know, he's judging by himself. He's not judging by the standard that was agreed upon. We have a standard that God agrees on. You know, in Matthew 7, we're told, be careful how you judge. Because with the same measure that you judge, you'll, you'll be judged. It's, it's like the Australian boomerang. Throw that thing out. Right? It comes right back to you. You'll receive the same thing. Come on, how many in here have ever had a bad day? Well, looks like three quarters of you are. I mean, everybody's had a bad day. Did any of you wake up that morning that you had a bad day and said, you know what? I just think I'm going to have a bad day today. I choose to have a bad day. I'm going I'm to have a bad day. No, 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 bad, day, bad, bad just happens. You didn't intentionally set out. Maybe you got some bad news. Maybe something happened. Maybe your alarm didn't go off and you overslept or your car broke down or, you know, your something. Set things in motion, Murphy's Law, whatever. Having a bad day from time to time is just normal. It's just normal going to happen. And you got to give yourself a break. And you generally do give yourself a break, you know, when you have a bad day. But have you ever thought about giving somebody else a break when they're having a bad day? Do you have compassion on them or are you just ah, 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 react with judgment, offense, or hurt? Listen, something, Yanni, you just need to get this down. You need to understand this quote. Hurt people hurt people. So if you're around somebody who's hurting people, who's just venomous, who's always, they're hurt. Maybe a little compassion would be in order. Maybe a little curiosity and maybe a few questions. And, man, what's going on? What happened? What? Can I buy you coffee? Can, can we, you know, just an act of, kindness, some kind of act of kindness to touch him, just, just to find out what's going on. I think it's time we should stop and ask people, why are you hurting? 
You see, the beginning point of being a Ghostbuster is first admitting, I'm not perfect. Now, you heard me say that. You know, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> but we all have to say that. We're not perfect. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. Nobody in this room is perfect. When we admit that, then we can move to the next level, right? And that would be intentionally letting the past go. That's what our text talks about. Paul saying, I forget those things which are behind. I forget them. Too many of us are living with the past in our face. Making decisions and thinking through life processes based on the mistakes. And you're always seeing all the negativity instead of, wait a minute, I can put that behind me and see the future that Jesus has for me. But when you bring the past here, man, it's like driving with looking in the rearview mirror. And you're going to join those Seattleites <laughs> hitting somebody else in the back end, and it's their fault. They shouldn't have stopped on the freeway. And thirdly, pursuing, purposely pursue your prize. Jesus has called you. Your calling is amazing. Your purpose is divine. Look at what, remember, look, just remind you, right? We're not perfect. We haven't attained. We haven't gotten there yet. But I press on, always forward, that I can lay a hold of the very reason that Jesus got a hold of me. Jesus doesn't waste his energy or his effort. He's blessed you with salvation because there's a job that he has for you to do. There are people he has for you to reach. There's family, friends, co-workers that he wants you to be the harvester in the field of their life. He wants you to bring the joy of the season. He wants you to bring his joy to them. We haven't gotten there. We haven't arrived. We haven't apprehended. But we've got to let go of the past. We've got to let go of those things which are behind. And we have to reach forward. This is a time of reaching in this church. This is a season that we've got to go for it. We've got to reach for it. We've got to believe for the better things. Don't look at the past. But look forward. Always forward. We've got to forget those things which are behind. We've got to press we got to press. You know, that doesn't mean just live life every day the way we've been doing it. It means pressing. Now, if I had a weight bench here, I'd show you some pressing. Or maybe I'd have Feliki show you some pressing. <laughs> right? There's some effort to it. But when you start here, when you begin here, when you admit, hey, I'm not perfect, I'm going to let go of the past, I'm going to pursue the prize. This is when you can begin to slay the ghosts of Christmas past and the ghosts of Christmas present, and you can change the ghost of Christmas future. You can be a ghost buster. You can come to the point where you make allowances for others' faults because you're operating in the love of Christ. And then you can forgive anyone who offends you. Just like that. Just like that. And then I love the fact the gospel has to put this in here for us. God had to put this into his word because we tend to be myopic. We tend to, to be short-sighted. We tend to forget, oh, yeah, God has forgiven me of a few things, hasn't he? Yeah. I don't even want to start down that list. I really don't. He says, look, the Lord forgave you. And can I tell you this? You didn't have a hard time doing it either. Because he loves you. He loves you dearly. He said, look, the Lord forgive you. He forgave you. So we need to forgive one another. And this is how we begin to slay the ghost of offense the ghost of Christmas past. 
Maybe an outlaw now becomes an in-law. Possibly they could even become an in-love because of the love of Christ that is operating in you and through you. Listen, we need to live forgiven. I said we need to live forgiven. We should celebrate the fact that we've been forgiven. It's all gone. We need to live forgiveness. We need to demonstrate, right? God demonstrates his love in this. We're called to imitate him. We need to live love. Wow. Go figure. It's on the wall. It's a reminder. We need to live love now. And this will help us every day, all the way through all the holidays that we have to face, the birthdays, whatever, celebrations. Listen, this is how God so loved you. He so loves that he gives. He so loves that he forgives. Will you so love? You see, God never kept an account of the wrongs. God doesn't ever rehearse them with you. He'll let you repent of them. He'll let you list them. But he doesn't come back to you and say, hey, hey, you remember when? Look, you're starting to go that direction again. You remember when you did it? No, 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 no. We know. He removes it as far as the east is from the west. You start with a clean slate when you ask for forgiveness. So the next time someone offends you, rather than rehearse the issue, why not just release it? Why not overlook it? Why not pass it over? You understand that rehearsing brings bondage to an issue? And if I had chains and ropes, right, every time you rehearse an issue, you're, you're, you're putting another loop around. You're just, you're tying yourself up more and not the person who did it. It affects you more when you rehearse it. It's time for us not to be historical. I'm telling you, the more historical you get, the more hysterical you'll get. Because there comes a point where you just get so overwhelmed with that yuck that you become hysterical. Ask me how I know. I've done too many years of marriage counseling. That's why love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Forgiveness doesn't excuse what people do. It simply releases you. It releases you to pursue the prize, the calling. The... Listen, life's too short to live with the ghosts. Life's too short and your calling is too great. There's an upward call on your life. Not a downward call. There's an upward call. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. There's a releasing call. When we release, when we overlook, then we live in the purity that God has for us. Listen, there are many good things ahead of you. Life is too short. So don't get ensnared with the ghosts of Christmas past. Take control of your destiny. Seal it today. Always forward. Always forward. All right, here's your weekly challenge. You need to make an honest assessment of where you are. Where are you today? What do you need to take care of? What do you need to, what do you need to ask for forgiveness of, of, of God or others? You need to give people a break. Catch this. Begin to transition between judging people based on what they're doing judging on their intent. Because just like the example of driving, oh, I guarantee there's a time when you cut somebody off because you were in a hurry. You were a little bit late and a little bit behind, you know, and it was okay when you did it. So we got to give people a break. Then we got to press on and press in. 
forget the past. Reach forward. Always forward. Always forward. Come on, church, say it. Always, Always forward. forward. Keep your eyes on the prize. Will you stand with me? That was a great message and one that, you know, we can apply every single day. Uh, extending grace, extending peace, extending joy uh, to other people and not getting after them when they, when they make a mistake. And, you know, I'm so thankful for God extending his grace and his peace and his joy to me. And if I'm not filled up, I can't give it out. Amen. Today, if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't experienced his grace, his free gift is salvation, His joy, His peace in your life. Or maybe you're not experiencing it right now. Maybe you did at one time. I want to invite you forward. Come on up right now. we got prayer team folks up here who will pray with you. Um, and let's really take this. I mean, this message can change your life. We've all met people who are constantly living in God's grace. And they're the most gracious, loving people that we encounter. And when you meet those people, they change lives. We can do that, church. Not on our own strength, but by God's grace. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for your salvation. Lord, we thank you that you extended forgiveness to us. God, that you wiped away all of our sin, God. God, that you made us right with you and with other people, God. We thank you for that, God. And God, we just declare this morning that you are our king. You are our God. God, we lay down our life, God, to pick up our cross and choose to follow after you, Lord. And God, I just pray for uh, every person here this morning, God, God, that you would fill them up with your grace, Father. Fill them up with your Holy Spirit, God. God, so we can make an in impact for your kingdom, God. God, we give you all the praise, all the glory this morning, God. God, I just ask a blessing on every person as they go, God. And I, I thank you that the peace that surpasses all understanding is going to rest and abide on them and in them. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. If you need prayer, go ahead and come on up. We still got people here who will meet and pray with you.